um, BOMSA, GOTA, and all our UK's inaugural National Research Webinar Series. Uh, thank you for joining. Um, so this is our first lecture of eight parts um, that will happen over the next two months. Um, we're really excited by this, and we hope this will give you more information about research in general and hopefully encourage you guys to undertake research uh, moving forward. Um, I would like to thank our UK and both her for their help um, with this series. Um, and just a small disclaimer, we are also working on a research fund um, that you will, you will have more details released about that in due course, so do watch the space. Um, that will be mainly targeted towards uh, TNO research. Um, and as more details come along, we will definitely mention that. Um, feedback surveys will be sent at the end of uh, each lecture, so please do fill them out if you um, want to get a certificate for each lecture. Um, the format of the talk will be 20 minutes um, per lecturer, so Dr. Shiv Kode will start first, followed by Mr. Ignatius Liu. Um, and all questions, if you could just put it on the chat, please, and it will be answered at the end. We have about 10 minutes um, for questions. Um, on that note, I will hand over to Dr. Shiv Kole, um, who, will, who will start this lecture. Thank you. Hi, guys. Um, th thank you, Nadir, for, for that intro. So um, this, this first, first lecture will hopefully uh, provide all of you here, who I assume majority of you are, are medical students, uh, and hopefully will provide you an introduction to the series. Uh, as well as an introduction to research as a medical student uh, and basically covering the why, when, how and what to do to get involved whilst you're a, a medical student. OK, so uh, as I said, my name is Shiv. Um, I'm currently an academic foundation doctor in, in uh, the northeast of England um, in Newcastle, and I've got an interest in trauma and orthopedic surgery. Um, and my current research is focused around all aspects of hip surgery involving young adult hip, elective hip and knee arthroplasty and hip fracture related research. And I've been in Newcastle for the last seven years as a medical student as well. So um, before we begin, uh, could everyone get their phones out and, and scan this QR code? It will take you to a Slido poll, which we're just using for um, interactive questions. Um, interactive polls, I mean, and if you've got any general questions, please use the Zoom chat function. Um, so once everyone's um, kind of scanned that, okay, I'll move on. I'll give it a few seconds. Okay, so we'll, we'll come back to the Slido poll, um, but a lot of medical students uh, sometimes are confused as to why you need to do research, because you don't need it to pass medical school exams. So what's the point? Why do you need to do it? Where do you start? And you might be simply intimidating by the prospect of medical research. And we've all been there. But as you kind of progress through medical school, you understand there's an increased importance that is placed on research on a medical CV, on a medical CV and for gen generic uh, career progression, especially if you want to go into a surgical field. So why? So if everyone uses their kind of Slido poll to kind of rank why you want to, why you might consider a research or academia and just rank these five categories in, in order of most important to you uh, or, or least important. Oh, number one reason should be it's cool. <laughs> okay, so I think, I don't know if that says there's only six participants voted or currently voting, I'm not sure. Oh no, there's 61 there, sorry. So yeah, keep on voting. I think there's about 116 of you in the, in the meeting. So it, try and get as many of you on here. So it seems like career is the top and it's probably not going to shift at this point, um, followed by interest 
and then higher degree, interestingly. But uh, okay. So yeah, I think it's as expected, really. I think the majority of people want to get involved earlier on in, in medical school into research for either career or interest. I think that's a fairly uh, blanket statement. Okay, so that's fine. And, and one of the thing is when it comes to what your why is, it it doesn't. it's not black or white, it's very personal and it varies from person to person. So I'm just gonna move on. So we need to remember that um, there are very few absolutes in, in healthcare, uh, in medicine and surgery. And all of us, medical students, or if there's any doctors, we all, we all work in an environment that practices evidence-based medicine. So everything that you learn and read from undergraduate textbooks and during medical school at some point was a research idea and a project. And someone would have thought of that research question, a plausible hypothesis, set out to test that, and then answer that question that over time has made it into clinical practice and what you're, what you're learning now in undergraduate medicine. So therefore, in a nutshell, the point of research is to know what is happening around you and why it is happening. Essentially, what the current or best practice is and why that is the case. And you can make it better by bringing new information or knowledge to light and challenge that current practice. And that is essentially uh, research in a nutshell. And you got, that, you got that novel opportunity to contribute new knowledge and be involved in the process. So for me, it was a curiosity thing and to contribute to that process. And it's a unique extracurricular activity. When done correctly, it will set you apart from other candidates uh, in future job applications, but it also demonstrates your own curiosity, initiative, dedication, usually to a particular specialty. So this is on, on, on the right of your screen, you can see a clover leaf. So that's um, essentially a framework that was developed by the Canadians that essentially identifies and describes the abilities that a, a good physician requires to effectively meet the healthcare needs of people that they serve. And one of those is being a scholar, engaging in scholarly activities, which hopefully this presentation and this talk will give you kind of those building blocks to, to get, get started in research. So kind of moving on, it, as I said, it's not black and white, it will vary from pe person to person. So what are these whys? And you can be all of these, you can be a few of these, you can be none of these, and it will, be ver it will vary. So, there's wider benefits. Obviously, being involved in research, you can improve patient care. That is the ultimate game. Uh, that is the ultimate kind of aim of, of, of medical research. This can be researching potential life-changing treatments, diagnosing diseases early or more accurately, preventing uh, pre preventative medicine, and essentially you want to improve the healthcare for, for the future. This is probably the uh, um, the, the majority of reasons why people want to be involved. So you person, personal benefits to getting involved, you're furthering your own interest and knowledge in a specialty of your choice. And that's super important because there's very few things that you have complete autonomy over whilst a medical student, but your research interest is something that you can control entirely. You can be interested in the most niche aspect of medicine um, and, and that is your choice. And you don't have to be, um, no one's telling you that you have to undertake this bit of research or this bit of research. So that's quite unique. You also get to contribute to scientific literature in an area of your interest and keep up to date yourself with the latest topics and trending topics, um, et cetera, et cetera. You also learn to critically appraise evidence. And that might sound like the most boring thing ever. But when you're a practicing clinician or surgeon, you need to be able to know what uh, the evidence, the papers, the presentations being published, how good that is. Because as you'll progress, you'll find out there's a lot of rubbish research being circulated and you need to ideally develop those skills to critically place research early on. And obviously the elephant in the room, kind of what most people would want to do it for is the points, 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 job applications, career progression, which Iggy will touch on later. There's also a lot of hidden benefits. It sets you apart early on, okay? So uh, you have the opportunity very early on in medical school to build your reputation and create your own career trajectory, which I'll come on to later on. 
And this kind of extends to networking with like-minded people all over the UK uh, through opportunities you never knew existed from conferences to talks, etc. Ultimately, by having a strong research foundation and contributing to advancing medicine, you'll have the opportunity to also kind of pursue leadership and management roles in the future. And if you look at any kind of leader, whether it's the Royal College of Surgeons, the GMC, um, the, uh, like any of these big organizations in medicine, the leaders are usually professors and they usually have an extensive research portfolio behind them. So it's all you just want to get involved because everyone else does or your mates are involved. And, and that's absolutely fine because medical school is the time and place to experiment if we choose this for, it is for you or not, no matter what your reason is or not, no matter what your kind of why is. So next is when do you do it? Well, when to take that first step into research? Well, if you're here right now, that's probably the, the best uh, kind of start to it. But do you do it in first year, second year, final year? It's not as black and, black and white as that. So for me, I was much more keen to take action and gain some research experience once I knew exactly what I wanted to do. Um, so I got inspired first and then I took action, uh, which worked for me because I knew I wanted to do orthopedics quite early on. Um, so as a way of demonstrating my commitment to the surgery, uh, to, to the specialty, to surgery in general, that's why initially I wanted to do something that interests me. So um that worked for me might not work for you and a lot of the times both of these things go hand in hand so you you might take action whilst getting inspired uh you might um meet someone really uh fun and engaging on clinical placement and want to do some research with them etc so but this was kind of in a nutshell get inspired take action that worked for me so you can get in involved at any time this is a timeline so the earlier the better okay so use time to your advantage especially if you're earlier on in medical school at the moment there's always an opportunity to get involved at any time so when you're in pre-clinical years you've got the opportunity to do summer vacation projects which i'll come on to when you're in your clinical years you've got ssc's you can do in anything you want to usually um, you've got intercalated degrees which some universities offer some are optional, and I'll kind of talk about the importance of, of doing it if you're seriously considering um, going into any specialty for that matter. But if you're interested in research, definitely intercalate. There's also electives, which you can do. And then later on in, in the foundation program, you can uh, apply for the AFP or the SFP uh, and pursue research that way. But all the way throughout medical school, some of the best ways of getting involved are research collaboratives, and finding a good mentor and supervisor that might be able to advise and guide you through doing a systematic review or meta-analysis. And we'll kind of touch on all those aspects. So how? So before starting, be honest, okay? What are you interested in? There's no point getting involved in a project area that you find boring, okay? How much time do you have available? It's crucial to think about this before committing to a project and most importantly, before committing to a supervisor. Um, okay, so and be honest, like, what do you want to get out of your research experience? Do you want a brief insight? Are you hoping for a presentation, a poster, a publication? And all of this um, kind of matters. And talk to people, talk to um, colleagues, talk to people in the year above you, ask them about their experience of research. Sometimes medical students find it difficult or intimidating or just some a bit clueless when approaching a supervisor. And I certainly was in that in, in that cohort of people when I started. Um, most universities have information about research groups on their website. So spend time exploring what's being what's happening at your institution and what if, if that's if that's what you're interested in. Identify those key research leads. Um, and when contacting someone from a research group, ask if they would be willing to offer you some guidance, some experience, and particularly make sure that uh, whoever you contact has a track record of supervising medical students and hopefully um, obtaining publications. Okay, There's nothing more annoying than being involved in a research project than it going nowhere and all your time and effort is wasted. So be honest if you don't have any prior experience either. And not have a flexible, uh, flexible approach, um, which I'll kind of come on to, but just make sure you're enthusiastic, intelligent, and, and willing to learn. 
And when you're contacting, this can be done in two ways. So either you email them or kind of meet them in person and then email them after. So this is um, Iggy asked me to uh, put in an example email of when I, this was my first ever email to a potential supervisor back and forth here. So about three or four years ago. Um, and he did not reply to me um, to start with. And I had to send another two emails after that. Um, and eventually he, he, he replied to me, but that just goes to show, and I'm still working with this um, supervisor to na till now. Um, we've uh, maintained a good working relationship over the last three or four years. So it just goes to show that no matter, you might send a few um, 10, 15 emails to different people, just be persistent. If you're enthusiastic, if you're truly interested and want to do research with that supervisor, they will make time uh, uh, and find, find a way to do that. So this is a typical project timeline. And the key bit here is that you're most likely to, uh, your supervisor will, will guide you best. At, uh, and it depends when you're doing, when you approach them, at what point of a typical research project they might um, involve you at. The majority of the time for medical students, it's data collection or data analysis and results as they're quite defined aspects of this kind of timeline. Um, but when you intercalate or do a summer project, there is the opportunity to um, do all of this, uh, potentially even more um, if, you've got that, if you've got the luxury of time. So I'll quickly go through kind of what you can do in preclinical years. So summer vacation projects, in a nutshell, you're in your first two years of uni, you have long summer holidays, right? So, which is great for traveling, but also, <laughs> Try and uh, if you're if you want to get a, a step ahead of the others, and if you want to do some interesting stuff, uh, consider doing a research project. And if you're uh, usually people do that as part of the university, they'll they'll have schemes. So just explore. Um, but it does take time, effort, and dedication. But you need to be proactive. Okay. But later on, it does pay dividends. It demonstrates a lot of skills and qualities that will set you apart. There's funding available. Just make sure you find a good supervisor and mentor by contacting the relevant university department or local department you're interested in and make sure you do this early. Um, and it, it, it's quite advantageous as I'll come on to. So my probably my single best research achievement was probably my first ever research project in third year. Um, and I did exactly that. I approached a supervisor in the university about six months, six to 12 months before the summer holiday I was going to do it in and then we thought of a project and I did it in basic science um, and you can you, you can reflect on that in future applications as well. So in your clinical years so you've got SSCs so these are usually shorter time frame it's mainly designed to give medical students a flavor of different specialties you get to pick what you want to do take the initiative to try and get the most out of it if possible, contact your supervisors early, um, be realistic with what you want to achieve. If you, you probably won't be able to do start and finish a research project in that time, but you can get involved in those defined aspects of, of, of research, whether it's data collection or uh, data analysis, or if you want to do an audit and a QI project, that's a good opportunity to do that. And one thing um, I did as well was do some preliminary work for kind of future uh, research projects. So in my SSC, I did the groundwork to then what became my intercalated degree, et cetera, et cetera. And if you demonstrate that long-term thinking, when you approach supervisors, that usually impresses them um, and they'll put more time and effort into you um, vice versa. Okay. Okay. So Intercalation is probably the best uh, time to do your research if you if you want formal experience in this. Degrees and disciplines vary by university. So again, decide what you want to do. In, in Newcastle, we had the phenomenal opportunity of doing a master's uh, in research and mine was during COVID. So I ended up doing a data analysis project, big data project, but ultimately you can do whatever you want but pick a good supervisor, pick someone with a track record of supervising, because otherwise there's too, too many projects that end up uh, too much projects and time that gets wasted otherwise. Okay. 
So I focus on what projects will give me the most transferable skills. So statistic and analysis, critical appraisal, managing large data sets, um, all of that stuff. And that went into why I chose the project I did. Um, and mine was looking at hip fracture surgery using the National Hip Fracture Database. And uh, it was more kind of prognostic based research. So, um, and this is probably, if you want a strong academic foundation, do an integrated degree. I know it's been removed from the foundation application, like FPAS or whatever. Um, but if anything, that if you were to do it, it, it shows an even greater contribute uh, um, commitment to surgery, if, if that's your interest, and to research as well. It's also in the literature shown to advance career progression integrating. So this is just a, um, an article that my supervisor um, had published on it. Again, electives are great. Um, I am still a bit salty because mine was cancelled because of COVID, but essentially the world is your oyster. You can go anywhere, do anything um, as long as the, uh, yeah. So be think big, think bold, combine your clinical experience with research experience, and that is probably the best way to stand out. You've got the opportunity to go to the most famous institutions uh, around the world, if possible, or even in the UK. OK, so just think big. And again, everything that I've said up till this point goes uh, is still useful for organizing electives, approaching supervisors, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if you're towards the end of, of, of your medical school um, journey, I can't stress enough how um, much I'd recommend the Academic Foundation program if you want to have a almost like have a flavor of what a career in clinical academia is like you can build on the foundation that you've already obtained hopefully from summer projects from intercalation from from any anything that you've done in medical school but the caveat to that is every afp in the country so northeast london southeast all of these deaneries will offer different things so in, in Newcastle, I'm very fortunate that I have two four-month protected blocks um, in F1 and F2 um, to do research, and uh, that is yours. You can do as much of, or as little as you, as you want, and that suits me and what all my extracurricular activities. So there's a separate talk on this at the end of the series about careers in academia, so I won't dwell too much on it, just um, I thought I'd mention it. Okay, and across all years, collaborative research is a great thing to get involved in. Uh, it's a great starting point. You can be a data collector in your local hospital that you're in placement on. Um, and also, if you find a good mentor, come up with a good research idea, they can uh, give you a review or meta-analysis to do. So again, these are different talks in our series, so make sure you, you come to them. And Iggy will touch on some of the examples of collaboratives later on. So just to finish my part of the talk, I think you need to think long term. So what type of surgeon you want to be? And you have the novel opportunity whilst in medical school to create your own career trajectory. Um, if you're genuinely interested in something and you want to pursue research opportunities in that area, you can kind of um, make your own path. Um, and it's you always think about what's your end goal? Obviously, you need short term deliverables about whatever project you do, whether that's presentations, publications, and that would be great for points. But also, if you're really considering a career in academia, try to think long term what, uh, what you can do now that will pay dividends maybe two, three, four, five years that, uh, later down the line. But also, um, remember, it's a marathon and not a sprint beware and remember about burnout burnout is hugely prevalent in the medical profession so just make sure that um whatever you do it's sustainable okay so um and and be honest with your supervisor if you think you're taking a bit too on just be like look i think i've got a bit too, too much on um can we kind of reevaluate what projects i'm involved in etc okay because it's a it's a long journey and you if you try i've been there and i've done that i've tried to cram lots into one year and then it's got out of hand. So just keep bear this in mind. And ultimately, research is hugely, hugely valuable and hugely, um, well, it's a door opener. So it's a major cornerstone activity. 
Uh, and if you take any of the advice from myself or Iggy today, you'll, you'll soon realize that research often leads to other unexpected opportunities um, and unique career prospects that will set you apart going forward. Um, and it's almost a bit of a domino or a butterfly effect in that respect. So um, this is the time to get involved if, 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 if you're interested. So those are my contact details. I'll um, hand over to Iggy now. Um, Hello, um, I love Slido, but I'm not sure if it works. Let me let me try it. Uh, cool. So after this, what do you want to be? If it works. Okay. That must be Siv. Could be your prof. Not sure what I want. That was how I felt when I was doing foundation. Okay, that's good. So, oh, sorry. So almost everyone is is kind of, let me just screenshot this because I think it's valuable data. Data is key. So, so everyone wants to be active in research in my career, but not a higher degree. And then your secondary thing is, is to get a job because you're a self-selected group that wants to be here. Um, well, I'll talk about core surgical training first, and I'll talk about ST3. So for I'm um, Ignatius, one of the um, ST6 going to ST7 in orthopedics. So I, I can see from top down, it's quite it's quite daunting when you get to this stage. Um, and I still remember core surgical training, foundation program, core surgical training, and ST3 like yesterday. Uh, I'm not like Siv where I got into AFE program. Uh, I certainly didn't get into the academic program, but I can tell you a bit about what, how to, how to do, how to play the system. Um, so the game, as everyone is obsessed with, is that uh, recently I did a careers fair in, um, in Cambridge. Everyone was obsessed with points, and I get it because I've been there, I've done that, um, and points is everything in terms of knowing where whether you get into the interview. So, so for example, core surgical training, now the scoring system is slightly convoluted. Um, so I wouldn't go into details because I'm not entirely sure 100%, but I know that for SD3, the, pre, the assessment itself is 30, 30 33 points, um, of which pure research, a PhD is worth two points, a master's is worth one point. Um, but that's one point for one year and the whole interview itself is 180 points with the pre-assessment. So in the grand scheme of things, it's not a lot. Um, so you still have to focus on the clinical side to be very good at your interview skills, to be able to present and sell yourself, but also knowing the, the best advice that someone gave me was knowing when to stop. So you can keep going at chipping at things like presentations, publications, audits, get get your so for core surgical training. Uh, I think I read through one of the chat questions is that, does it have to be in surgery? No. Does it have to be in orthopedics? No. It can be in medicine, which is what I did. Um, but if, you, if you've won a prize in a medical conference or in... Um, or in a GP conference or in a pathology conference, it does not matter. As long as you've ticked the box and one of the consultants or a senior registrar um, does your pre-assessment and gives you the points, okay? Um, this is the SC3 applicant book, which the maximum score, there's an algorithm, everything's online. You can look at the algorithm. Out of the 30 points, I think publication is only about 10 to 15 points. So it's not a lot. So you can get a maximum point out as per if you're a first author or a second author. And the thing that really catches people out, especially for orthopedics, assuming everyone here wants to do orthopedics, is that your it has to be PubMed ID'd. Um, it has to be not, it, it does, it cannot be um, a case report. It cannot be um, 
it cannot be a technique uh, paper. So those are the nitty gritty things that you have to just catch out. So sometimes it will say, do not like, for example, this SC3 one for orthopedics, do not include published abstracts. So for example, you went to British elbow and shoulder and then they publish it in the shoulder and elbow as a published abstract does not count. Case report does not count. Letters don't count. Technical tips don't count. Um, presentations since medical school. So this is one of the things that is important for everyone, especially um, especially thinking, when do I start these? So these points carry you carry with you and it becomes currency, especially at, at, at my stage when you're going for higher posts like clinical lectureship, um, NIHR positions. Um, the other thing I was going to say is be careful of collaboratives. Every single year, selection um, selection into training has always varied and it depends on the chair for the selection design group. So for example, this one says collaborative work will only be considered as a publication if you have clear evidence that you have played a significant role. Now, what a significant role is, it's up to debate, but I'll, I'll talk about collaborative works in a bit because that's where um, my main focus is in terms of my, my research output. Um, we know core surgical training is competitive. So about three to one, two to one. We know SD3 is competitive, but don't ever forget the actual interview. So the interview scores, which we talked about, you still have your management station on the day itself to say what sets you apart from, for example, a very common question is what sets you apart from other candidates. If you were to go to an ACF interview, um, the, the interview questions are set. So for example, say, say for Siv or Nadir, who's now coming off foundation program, and you're going towards academic uh, clinical fellowship, ACF1, so ST1 or ST3 ACFs, so they tend to be lumped together and their interview dates are almost always in, uh, um, the release is always November for, no, uh, for a January interview. So the ACFs uh, tend to be in the same timeline as core training ST1s, so same time as radiology, GP. Um, and the interview questions are set on the NIHR website because it's being shared with someone else. Uh, so say, for example, TNO, when I applied, um, it was shared with GP on um, a stream on a stream called Acute Care for the Elderly. So your projects have to come from the same theme, but the funding stream comes from um, NIHR. There's, a, there's always a theme. So say for acute care or for Jerry's or for uh, pathology. Th those are the bigger subsets. And obviously you want, as Siv kindly suggested, you want to know your literature, your practice for patient care and contribute to the body of evidence. And now this, uh, you have to start small somewhere. So I still remember this was FY1. Um, I got involved with ACID and published a letter and I thought, oh my God, great letter. Uh, but it didn't count. But at least it got me thinking about how to analyze data, how to submit um, my next paper, which I did with a friend. So you always need a mate, right? Everyone needs a friend. Everyone needs a colleague who is like-minded, um, who's able to publish with you. So this, even though it was a technical tip, um, did score points during my time for core training. Um, and it, it taught me how to publish because no one really teaches you how to publish because everyone's obsessed with publishing, but the nitty gritties of it is difficult. So always get a friend. So Mobin's strength was data collection. So he can grind any data collection really quickly. Um, and my aim, what my game was to play stats. So Mr. Bailey, who was my senior reg at that point, God, he was ST7 and I'm now, I'm now ST7. Uh, so he's now in Glasgow. Uh, but basically he came up with the idea. He said, do this and this. Mobin took the Excel, Mobin collected the data. I've analyzed the data and we wrote the manuscript together along with Mr. Joseph. So you want to play to your strengths. You want to know what's already published out there, but don't repeat it 
um, but copy what the papers have already done in a very similar format. So in this situation, it was to look at um, inter and intra observer variability. And I use Graphpad Prism. You can use PS, P, SPSS. You can use whatever stats uh, machine uh, software that you're familiar with. And ultimately, say your end game is to want to be a professor. So this is this is one of the one of the biggest papers last year in orthopedics. Whether you do a cemented or uncemented hemioartoplasty, these pa these papers in New England Journal changes practice. It's very well designed, but ultimately, what it tells you as someone that wants to have that kind of career is that there's a lot of money involved then money design the money then the funding creates your team or you create a team and find the funding you need someone that constantly looks at your stats and how your design is if you were to if you know that this question needs a randomized control trial you want to know how you power the study and you want to collaborate so there's no point doing research alone so the gone are the days where you do a single center randomized control trial by a single surgeon the gone are the days because it's not applicable to everyone it's not generalizable and no one in the higher bodies want to see papers like this because they want papers that change practice they want papers that are generalized to the to the population and they want cost effectiveness so in especially nice guidelines these are the papers that change practice and that's the ultimate reason why you want to publish in a high impact journal and pick the low hanging fruit so when we're talking about collaboratives even though collaboratives haven't um haven't strictly counted for sc3 this year if you have the helped design the local pathway um, been the local lead, for example, Global Surge and COVID Surge, which was a phenomenal um, success. So when I started as a medical school, COVID Surge was a simple project idea by a few, um, the Global Surge was a very simple idea by a few general surgeons. Um, and he's now um, a PhD, post PhD NIHR registrar in Birmingham. Uh, and one of the professors in, Bur in Edinburgh where I studied. So it's, it's managing big data sets that make huge input output. And from COVID search, if you follow orthopedic Twitter, which I recommend everyone should, um, is that it, it's had 26 publications or something ridiculous like that. And all because there's a lot of collaborators. And plus, you start to understand how data protection works putting data into a set where it's safe. You understand simple red tape, like getting collaborators, getting a consultant supervisor, getting um, your local clinical governance uh, and audit department to approve. Sometimes even that is ridiculously hard. Um, but these are simple, simple skills that are translatable. And if you've managed to publish uh, or present it locally, most collaboratives are audits, and you can put that down as an audit. So just moving forward to um, how you actually physically publish. So most people would have a publishing manager. So um, I think RCS Annals uses a different one, but the, the formatting looks very similar to some publishers, whereas the surgeons uses EM. So surgeons is the Royal College of Edinburgh. So you, you're most commonly greeted with this page. You want to become an author. You submit the manuscript. You choose what your article type is. But even before that, you want to know whether you have a research question or a supervisor that can provide you with a research question to be able to execute that question. Then you want to know what article you want to write up. Hopefully before that, you have roughly what stats you're going to use ultimately you want to even before starting on that journey where you've been looking at data after data for three months you want to know what your journal or publication is so you want to know what conference you want to go to to present this work you want to know the impact factor of that journal you're publishing and plus it's a bit like um it's a bit like imagine the bmj that comes to your house every day you want to know who reads it like and who, whoever reads it does it change their practice that's ultimately it. And 
and yes, there's big stakeholders like nice guidelines and all that kind of stuff. But you want people to actually read your paper either on their website um, or a, a paper copy. And obviously, big impact factors uh, have big university implications and outputs with regards to funding, because there's a complex algorithm out there to say how many people, how many times a, a university lecturer has been cited and what their impact factor is, because that's how funding works in university se uh, setting. So ultimately, academia is what you want. This is very, very important. If not, as reading along the lines of low-hanging fruit, choose a journal that has a low impact factor or lower impact factor suitable for your article. I've been a reviewer a few times. And if you think of it as if you had a friend who's burning their last minute, last minute um, essay and said, can you have a look at this essay? The day before submission, they have the chance to change their format, change their writing style, change the simple things. Um, but as a reviewer, you, you're not, you don't have the luxury of that because there is a paper out there that, have, that has calculated how many free hours a reviewer has given to the scientific world and it equates to trillions. So every time we read a review article, maybe billions, not trillions, um, Every time you read an article, it's always free. You read, you take about 10, 15, 10 minutes to read through it in real in realistic terms. Then you go, does it suit? Does it suit this journal? Did they follow the format? Um, hopefully the journal editor, as well as the journal administrator has gone through this and said, you did not put it in Arial. You did not put the lines. You did not put the page number. Reject. Usually is the case. If they if they kind of like your idea, they might keep it and make sure you change all your formatting before it gets to the edit sub editors. So say for example, Bone and Joint Journal Pediatrics is governed by the pediatric surgeon. So the editor and the sub editors of that section will look at it. And it is it is it, I cannot emphasize how important this is because if if your first impression is bad the reviewer is not going to continue reading it and just downright reject it. So if you've got one reviewer reject and a second reviewer accepts, um, then it goes back to the editor and the editor then decides what to do. If you've got both accept, fine. That's the whole format of peer reviewing. But if you've got reject, reject, or reject, accept with minor revisions or accept with major revisions, then you're in difficult situations because most journals will only accept about 10 to 20 percent of pub of, of submitted journals, submitted um, submitted articles. And uh, because it's controversial, I'm not going to talk about paid uh, publications. Um, yeah. So it's stronger with numbers. So we know that um, collaboratives, for example, if you want to do orthopedics, support our collaborative work. Medical students can join, core surgical trainees can join, anyone can join. Um, making sure that you subscribe to BOTA or BOA newsletters. So we will always tell you what the next uh, project is. So open and FF POM. So whoever has listened or read the article in Bone and Joint, these are two, if not three or four publications that have come out of the BOTA collaboratives. It starts, it started off. Um, with being a very simple project with very good funding streams and methodology. And actually it's quite historical. The methodology for in orthopedics came from Chris Besterton, where he started um, the orthopedic, where he, he and a group of people within Bolter started the Bone Collaborative. And then now we've moved on towards the Royal College uh, funded um, research decision tree, where we support projects that will flourish into trainees focused uh, publications and ultimately you want to present so i cannot emphasize the importance of presenting it at a conference not only for just points but for for going to uh the social of it the um the 
the knowledge base that you can get from these conferences. And you can always go to JTO to get these information and use our website at Bolter um, to look for projects and the next grant and ideas for uh, collaborative work and research ideas that you can pitch to us and then we'll be able to roll it out. And ultimately, as Siv says, it snowballs. The typical academic pathway um, is that once you get to AFP, then you can always get to ACF. I did not get into ACF. I was shortlisted, but it is very competitive. And ultimately, you, you don't have to be in the academic pathway. You can do PhDs, masters, MD, um, anything that that suits your personal um, circumstances, because ultimately, it is about what you want to do. So hopefully uh, you will join us for the next few talks. Uh, I'd like to thank all the faculty that has given up their time in the next few weeks of the of this series, as well as Nadir, who's put a lot of effort into this, as well as the team at ORUK. You can find the events on the ORUK website. And I just want to signpost a few things where um, a, a lot of fun things that we're doing at Bolta, which is Dragon's Den every single year. So we haven't seen medical students join us. So we want to see it this year, hopefully with the drip fund that we're starting with Bomza or UK and Bolta. So Dragon's Den is where you come and pitch an idea and, and four scary professors will come and um, quiz you on what your research project's about. In uh, East of England, as well as it's Bolta and BOA supported, yeah, you can join our Clinical Research Methodology Day on the 29th of June. And other um, societies that you can join is British Orthopaedic Research Society, uh, which is going to be in Cambridge as well. Just to end, I would like to say you want to find a mentor that will look after you, spend the time that is required to finish the project, plan the project and what suits your personal life. And it is a great network and you meet a lot of friends on the way. Thank you. Perfect. Uh, thank you, um, Iggy and Shiv. Um, I hope you guys found that useful. There are a couple of questions on the chat that I will just run through quickly. Mm -hmm. um, so I think Dhananjian, he said, is it imperative to have research experience solely or predominantly in the specialty you are interested in? I think he says he's in preclinical years and he finds the opportunities that he's eligible for to be limited. Would it be advisable to undertake research, research in any medical field for the purpose of gaining some preliminary research experience which he can build upon? Yes. So whoever yeah. supervisor you've got, um, always ask the question because um, as clinicians, we always have stuff that has either we've passed on or moved on or there's always stuff to do. Agree, Steph. I think just to add to add to that, I think if you're a medical student and you don't yet know what area of medicine or, or surgery you're interested in, it's even more important to pick a good supervisor, um, as you're more likely to get something out of it that way. Um, so, yeah, just just that to add to it. Yep. Um, then. Aaron, um, he said he studies abroad. Is it possible to get involved virtually as a data collaborator or something along those lines? So uh, Global Surge is international. Um, so you can always find centers that collaborate on that. There are a few projects that are international. Um, so I will look for international collaboratives, but they're, they're quite time limited. So once it opens, it closes within eight weeks. So always keep an eye on Twitter. Twitter is the best way to find out for these things. Because uh, I think um, COVID surge obviously had like COVID surge one and COVID surge two, so it depends on your hospital. The I know um, one of the Bolta the orthopedic projects, PPAC, which is looking at K wiring in supracondylars and distal radius fractures, whether you give preoperative antibiotics or not. That's been that's an international uh, collaborative now. So be so be in touch with um the lead author, but otherwise I think getting ethics for an international project is quite difficult as a lead chief investigator. 
Yeah, Ashiv, anything to add to that or? No. Uh, no. Um, uh, yeah, so Joanne, yeah, these slides will be up um, on YouTube later this week, as will all other um, sessions. Um, then the next question is, what was the orthopedic group you said to follow on Twitter? I think you mentioned, I think you said author Twitter, if I'm not mistaken. So that's just, I think just general. Yeah, the hashtag ortho Twitter. And then um, once you follow a few people, it will start suggesting. So follow Siv first and then follow <laughs> ORUK, obviously, and then follow Bonza. <laughs> Follow everyone, and then it will start suggesting. The Twitter algorithm is very good, so I'm not promoting Twitter, but yeah, yeah, you all of them will come up. Um, and what is the software you use for your statistics? Graphpad. Um, we have a statistics lecture as well, purely um, dedicated to statistics. Um, later on as well. Um, so I think Eleanor said, how would you advise going about finding a research question? I always hesitate to approach a supervisor asking, do you have a project I could do? Um, so I'd rather bring an idea to them. Um, so they've gone, you, yeah, you, do you want to untake this one? Then I'll add mine. Yeah, yeah, yeah. so I, um, yeah, there's, it, it's a spectrum, isn't it? You don't want to approach a supervisor just asking for a project and keep it to open. I think what I did is if you if you think kind of five to 10 years down the line, that's what I did. And I was like, right, I find clinical trials. Tell me to when I'm a trainee or something to get involved in trials. So and then you kind of extrapolate that down to what's possible whilst at medical school. So um when i don't know if you you saw that kind of email that i'd sent one of my supervisors back in fourth year but i'd seen him talk at a conference about something which sounded quite interesting and as a medical student you're not an expert you don't really know what they're talking about half the time but if you're interested in something so he was in, in, interested in quality improvement projects he'd um done a lot of kind of uh, infection work and hip fracture work so I was interested in hip fractures and I wanted to it was improving quality improvement so I approached him just being like do you have any projects around this stuff this is what I want to do in five ten years and they will have the experience and knowledge to guide you to do something that's both deliverable then and there uh, short term but will also set you up to do um, other projects that kind of follow on in a theme later on if that makes sense um, I don't know if 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 that's good uh, good advice yeah. or if you've got anything to add Iggy. I think in the practical sense you, you don't have to phrase it as do you have any projects for me to do because we always it's a very open question so I think the easiest way is if the department has PhD or MD students or any academics that's probably the easiest one where you go I need time off for project um, I would like to be part of a PhD group so that's one way of doing it um, the other way is if you've identified your hospital is not part of a collaborative you say the this collaborative project that is going to be open in may or june can i help can i have a registrar can i approach any registrar consultant to be pis on this project for this collaborative um, and helping me with all the clinical governance and information government stuff governance stuff a second way, um, the third way, which is probably when as you practice, as you approach clinical practice is more is easier, is that um, uh, these this is obviously the next stage. So now you've done some projects, you understand the methodology. Now, the the ultimate thing about research questions is always published online. So nice guidelines will always put towards the very end to say question A, B, C, D, E has not been answered. And who do you think will get the next quarter million uh, pounds to do those projects? So professors that will, professors or lead chief investigators that have looked at that and go, oh, um, we're st why are we still debating about anterior or posterior, anterior, anterolateral or posterior approach to the hip? for a hip fracture. We're gonna do a ra international randomized control trial. 
And now NICE guidelines says everyone does anterolateral. So th that's the question. So now I think the latest NICE guidelines for, um, there was one question where it says distal radius fractures when they were manipulated in A&E, what is the role of using image intensifiers there and then? That's one question. That's a very good question and um, difficult to execute, but those are that will be the next level. Um, perfect, thank you. Um, then a question from Sumed, any tips to, for how to go about learning good research skills and knowledge without interpolating? Uh, without, inter I didn't intercalate. You don't have to intercalate. Phil, did you intercalate? I intercalated, but um, if you, 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 part of it is learning as you're doing it. So even if you don't intercalate, the intercalation just gives you formal teaching on it, which could be good teaching, could be bad teaching, and it will vary. But if you you can just learn by doing as well, which is just um, and, and from your supervisor. So stuff like critical appraisal, there's loads of resources online to learn and that you can do from your own room. You most medical schools have um, literature review and critical appraisal assignments, especially in their preclinical years. And if you and if you get involved in collaborative research, usually that's quite good because you play a small part in a huge project which usually has good output um, so you can even though you're not doing a lot in the grand aspect of things you can still learn um, from if you if you like learn from the whole project as a whole as opposed to um, as, a, as opposed to being told exactly what to do but yeah there's there's loads of there's loads of resources online, but I think the the best way to learn about research is to do it, uh, and then obviously some formal research degree helps at some point. But yeah, yeah, I mean, practicalities, I guess. Yeah, it has to be practical because you you then bump into problems where you go, uh oh, my stats doesn't work, and then or you you have this really classic one where he goes, my p value is zero point zero six. This, that is the worst that is the worst thing you can say to one of your friends and there you go oh, does p-value actually matter and then you can start a debate yeah i mean i got involved in research in second year and most of the skills i learned was from the supervisor and his team um so yeah you don't need to integrate to get good research skills um next another twitter question what twitter accounts would you recommend following um, well Bolto, Bonza, Siv. Bolto, Bonza. Yeah. Or, <laughs> or, okay. yeah, you follow a few and then people will pop up. Do you recommend the AFP to everyone or just people looking to become professors, for example? Uh, for anyone who either is already interested in research or if you're just trying to get interested in research as a fourth or fifth year, then it's a good flavour of what... Um, a career in clinical academia looks like and it's not just for people who want to do uh, research as a career it's it's a no strings attached way of having a a taster but it's again all the deaneries offer different programs so if you are in a deanery that offers one day a week off the ward doing and, and that's protected research time that is very different to say Newcastle, where I get eight months over the course of two years, which is completely protected for for research. So the um it, it will it very it varies on that scale. So, but in answer to your question, it's for it's for everyone, not just people who want to do um clinical academia or become professors. And don't worry if you don't get into AFP. I didn't get into AFP. I didn't get into uh, ACF. It's like a story of my life. Um, one thing to add to um, AFPs, uh, especially if you're doing a clinical block, is that most F1 uh, jobs um, nowadays anyway, once you get into F2, people think about locoming. So this is all about cost of living and 
um, you won't have any on calls in your academic block. So if you start on research, um, just bear that in mind, especially now it's hot topic. Um, and most people will want to do something like A&E or a medical or surgical so that you can at least stay in touch with the department to say, can I come back to an empty slot to do on calls during my academic block? It's practical, just, yeah. Um, why is it being recorded? Yeah, there's a link on the chat for everyone. Um, another question about F1. So in terms of choosing hospitals for F1 as part of the standard foundation program, is it better to apply for a larger teaching hospital rather than a DGH in terms of accessing research opportunities? Big hospital. Uh, yeah. yeah. At least strategically for F1. I'm currently at DGH. There, there are research opportunities, but I think larger teaching hospitals definitely have better opportunities. Mm. If you if you know you're deficient in research, target big hospitals. Um, if you know that you're deficient in clinical, clinical experience and management and simple things, day-to-day -day life, then go to a DGH. But if you know that you're gonna, you already got a few projects starting and you can finish it with good output, then you can trade that off by going to DGH so that you can get more practical, practical knowledge for the interview. Um, so you mentioned that the specialty of your research will not matter in regards to applications into CST, but would there be much benefit if you got orthopedic research for an orthopedic application? No. So if in your management, in management station, they won't pick on it. They will just, they will know that you've published in X, Y, and Z. That score is done. That gets put aside. Management and portfolio questions are, are very generic. So things like, how do you improve diversity and equity in orthopedics? How do you uh, improve the, um, the curriculum? And what do you think of elective hubs? Tell me about yourself. What sets you apart from another candidate? It's going to be very generic. You take them down where you want to go. Not that, oh my God, you did not do an orthopedic paper. Um, and the last question, I think just a follow up from the, the DGH versus teaching hospital question. He says that he's stuck between choosing DGH for rotations that I prefer versus applying to being larger teaching hospitals where I may have access to more research opportunities. What advice would you give in this scenario? So for, I, I, I would, don't, don't deep it too much. Don't, don't overthink it. Um, it's, I am at a major teaching hospital. I'm at a MTC currently, the RVI in Freeman, but I'm doing my research in a DGH. So I'm doing the opposite. Um, so it, it will vary from DGH to DGH, and it will vary from teaching hospital to teaching hospital. So don't overthink it. Um, it is my, is my uh, advice because I'm doing the complete opposite to you. Whatever is suitable in that situation, it is it's so fluid that you can't, you, you can try to position yourself in an MTC, but then sometimes not all MTCs are very good at research output because the clinical work is just heavy because there's a lot of major trauma. Um, it it all depends on the institute, and it, but the but the best thing is if you found a mentor, latch on to them, whether it's DGH or MTC. Yeah, and then just say I want to publish, and then just keep snowballing. Yeah, perfect. Um, so I think that's the end of the questions. If anyone has anything else, um, you can just unmute yourselves and ask now. But I think, yeah, that's come to the end um, of the session. Um, our next session is on the 29th of March. Um, so it's two weeks on Wednesday at seven o'clock. And it's how to write a research paper, research questions and outcome measures. Um, so hopefully we'll see all of you guys there. Um, and yeah, let, let your colleagues know, let your friends know. Um, like I said, again, it's free. Um, so we look forward to next two weeks on Wednesday. Uh, thank you, Shiv and Iggy for your help um, and giving the talk today and to Hannah and Lydia as well from our UK. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you for your...